please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, in light of tonight's special visit from our missionary and our study tour that we've just returned from, it seemed very appropriate to revisit the powerful epistle, theologically most important epistle in all the 66 books of the Bible, most foundational to much of our Christian faith, our understanding of salvation, you could say soteriology as well as eschatology, doctrine of salvation and of end times and of these last days and God's plan for the future. Romans, particularly chapter 11, we're going to focus, focus on verses 25 through 32. Romans 11, 25 through 32. If you'd like a title, let's make it a question. Is God done with Israel? Is God done with Israel? I pray that this will be a Christian view of the Jew for you. It's something we all need, perhaps for some of you for the first time, and all of us in an, a renewed way. It's something we're sure not going to get from society, and I'm afraid from not many Christian churches today either. You could also subtitle this message, Beloved Enemies and Surprising Mercy. Beloved Enemies and Surprising Mercy. This chapter, Romans 11, answers one of the perennial questions and greatest dilemmas of history. A mystery acknowledged even by secular authors and unbelieving non-Christian writers. For example, Mark Twain, the famous novelist from America, he says, all things are mortal except the Jew. All other forces pass, but the Jew remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Max DeMont, after 20 years of research, this brilliant secular historian wrote a book, Jews, God, and History. And Dr. DeMont wrote the whole book to answer this one question. He says, a civilization is born, it reaches maturity, and usually it dies. That's the pattern of history. It was with the Babylonians and the Persians and the Romans. Why not the Jews? Well, how have the Jews survived throughout 4,000 years of human history? Why has this small band of people continued to exert such influence on so many civilizations? And please note, this is in spite of being scattered for the last 2,500 years until very recent history in some of our own lifetimes. This is not the Egyptians, this is not Asian peoples still on their own soil. Frederick the Great, king of Prussia, 18th century, once asked his chaplain, give me your best evidence for the existence of God, to which the chaplain for Frederick the Great, this Prussian king, the chaplain replied, the amazing Jew, your majesty, the amazing Jew. British prime minister in the 19th century, Lord Beaconsfield, also named Benjamin Disraeli, writes, the world has by now discovered that it is impossible to destroy the Jews. Only to find after that the horrors of the Holocaust and a seemingly endless, futile and ongoing efforts to annihilate Israel as we hear every week in the headlines from Iranian lips. And yet still they have failed. One of the top modern historians of our day, Paul Johnson, he just recently died, British author, has a whole book called The History of the Jews. Johnson writes, no people has ever insisted more firmly than the Jews that history has a purpose and humanity has a destiny. Abraham Heschel, one of the leading theologians and Jewish philosophers in the 20th century, Heschel writes, the presence of Israel is the repudiation of despair. Israel calls for a renewal of trust in the Lord of history. My friends, are you ready for this? I think you, many Christians like you and me, despair too quickly, lose hope too quickly, and are more discouraged because we don't get Israel. And we have failed to grasp the role of the Jews and so we live discouraged lives that we think are totally unrelated to what's happening in Israel. It's the whole reason Romans 9 through 11 is preceded by Romans 1 through 8. If God has promised 
no condemnation in Christ, if all the glorious comforts for Gentiles and Jews in the church of Romans 1 through 8 are ours, then it means we can trust God. But if he's rejected the Jews and he broke his promise and he uh, lost that loving feeling and can't be trusted to keep his word to the Jews, you can't trust him either. And Romans 1 through 8 are also a lie. And we have no hope if he's done with the Jews. David Larson, excellent book called Jews, Gentiles, and the Church, writes, how have the Jews virtually alone avoided genetic regression of IQ and achievement? Been successful for 4,000 years. Hittites, Kenites, Canaanites, they're all gone. But like Jonah, the Jews, like the stubborn prophet, tossed out into a swirling stormy sea, consumed by the great fish, indigested, and vomited up on the land. (laughs) Romans 11 answers this epic question of Jewish survival. It's not just their incredible tenacity. Our tour guide was mentioning a wonderful book that I would highly recommend and I was already familiar with called Startup Nation by uh, Signor and Singer, famous authors uh, 20, 30 years ago. It was a best-selling book, the phenomenal uh, birth of modern Israel. It's, it's, it, it puts to shame dozens of nations by comparison. And you all know the, the, the amazing <laughs> tenacity and, and, uh, of, of uh, many of our Jewish friends but it's a godless book. It misses the backstory. It ignores the theological reason behind it all and the biblical explanation. See, beloved, Romans 9 through 11 stares at two massive truths that seem contradictory and irreconcilable and paradoxical, and Paul says they aren't, and you must hold on to both and let go of neither. On the one hand, Paul says there is the present condition of the Jews. On the other hand, there's the future promises for the Jews. Don't let go of either, hold on to both. At present, the Jews in Paul's day, in our day, they're cut off from God, they're they're hardened, they're unbelieving, they're dying without Christ, they're headed for hell, they need to be evangelized. And yet, God isn't done with the Jews. He's made tons of promises to them as an ethnic nation. And and they're yet to be fulfilled. And as we're about to read, he says they will be saved. You don't get to choose which to hold on to, the present condition of the Jews or the future promises of the Jews. If God is faithful, if he is merciful, and if his word can be trusted, you have to hold on to both. So then, one of the most hotly debated questions in the history of the Christian church, is God done with the Jews? Are they his people? Don't answer out loud. Are the Jews today, when you bump into a Jewish friend or you visit Israel, are they God's people? According to the Bible, you must say, Yania. You must. Yania. Yes and no. Welcome to the adventure of Romans 9, 10, and 11, the compelling case that Paul is making. Individually, no. They are not the people of God. But corporately, yes. It goes back to the biblical doctrine of election. The Bible teaches not only the election of individuals for salvation, but the election of the nation of Israel for privilege and for a unique role and purpose and historical and eschatological function. God chooses individuals for redemption, for salvation, both Jew and Gentile, all united now in Christ in this church age. But God also chose the Jewish nation, not all of them for salvation, but as a ethnic identity, as a national people for a earthly purpose. How do you know the difference when the Bible is talking about individual election or corporate election. Answer, context, context, context. (laughs) Always the most important clue and key in proper interpretation of scripture. What is the key that unlocks all of the meaning of Romans 9 through 11 and where the sparks fly and the debate really comes on this issue? It starts with Romans 9 verse 6. What does Paul say? Look back there, Romans 9 verse 6. Has the word of God failed? Answer, it is not as though the word of God has failed, verse, Romans 9, verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are, what? 
descended from Israel. Look up here. There's an outer circle and there's an inner circle. There's the whole group and there's a subset within that group. Paul is saying, I believe, not all ethnic Israel, the larger group, the outer circle, are spiritual Israel, the inner circle, a smaller subset of that larger group. All individually elect saved Jews are part of his corporate election, but not all of national ethnic corporate Israel are individually elect. Most of them are damned right now. They reject Jesus and they die and go to hell unless we bring them the gospel. But one day, the outer and the inner circles will converge into one and all Israel will be saved. And God has promised that to no other nation. You cannot say that about Americans or Afrikaners. Tell that to the last 200 years of cultural confusion in this country of an ethnic people who got it wrong and who stole the promises of God for their ethnic identity. Tell that to the Germans. Tell that to nation after nation who got it wrong and perverted the promises of God. The Jews alone can claim that. Have you noticed people say, oh, that's so ethnocentric. How could God favor the Jews? And how do they solve that problem? By becoming egocentric instead. God's not concerned about the Jews anymore. It's me, a Gentile. Okay, so you're mad that you think God's ethnocentric, so you solve that by becoming egocentric. Go figure. How convenient. Paul marshals his case here in Romans 11. He's really answering one big question. Look at verse one in the chapter. How does it begin? Romans 11, has God, I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. God forbid, he answers in the most emphatic, strongest language. Verse, he answers, he asks again in verse 11. I say then, they, did, they Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. Let me summarize the whole chapter for you in one sentence. Romans 11, by the way, if you get lost at some point, I've treated along with other better preachers than me, but uh, you, if you want to go on Antioch's website, we studied this in detail a few years ago, Romans 9 through 11 online. But the whole chapter could be summed up as follows. The rejection of the Jews is neither total nor is it final. Israel's rejection is neither total, that's verse 1 through 10, it's only partial. There's still a remnant. And it's not final. Verses 11 through the end of the chapter. It's only temporary. And the threat that Paul is addressing in the Roman church, which was mostly Gentile, he says that, right? He's an apostle to the Gentiles, verse 13. He magnifies his ministry. Uh, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, he says there uh, uh, later on. The warning is of Gentile pride. Look at verse 18. Do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, uh, again, look at verse 20. Uh, they were broken off from unbelief. You stand by your faith. Do not be conceited. And we're going to see it again in the passage. What's the number one reason, many would say, for the Holocaust and the slaughter of six million Jews? I think it's fair to say one of the top, if not the top reason was the Christian church surrendered to Gentile arrogance and forgot her Jewish roots. I think it explains a lot of the catastrophe of apartheid in this country as well. It's forgetting our Jewish roots. Paul then follows with two pictures to puncture our Gentile pride, to humble us about God's plan for Israel so that we don't fall away as they have fallen away. And the two pictures he gives is a pendulum and an olive tree. Verses 11 through 16, he gives, and I'm just, it's just background before we come to our passage, a nice short little introduction here. <laughs> 
a pendulum and an olive tree. First of all, verses 11 through 16 is a pendulum. How God starts with the Jews so that Gentiles will be reached and he, he keeps moving who is on center stage. And now the Gentiles in the church age are on center stage so that the Jews will be made jealous. You'll hear our brother Israel tonight. He'll say, I grew up in a village 10 Ks from where Jesus was, grew up. He grew up 10 Ks away from Nazareth, but the Lord had to take me 10,000 Ks to South Africa to meet Jesus. <laughs> he used the Gentiles to make a Jew jealous. It's these pendulum purposes of God. And then one day he will restore the Jews so that even greater blessing will flow to the Gentiles. Pendulum followed by second picture, also to puncture our Gentile pride, to humble us about God's plan for Israel, and it's found in the olive tree, verses 17 through 24, as Damon even mentioned earlier. And so we come now to verses 25. Please stand as we hear the word of our Lord as I read sacred scripture. Thank you. Listen as I read in your Bibles now, Romans 11 from verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also might be, may now be shown mercy. For, verse 32, God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Gracious Father, we pray with the hymn writer, God of salvation, come to thine own sons at length. Arm of the Lord, awake, put on almighty strength. To thine own chosen flock, the great deliverance bring and show this astonished earth that you are Israel's king. Oh Lord, we want to know more of Paul's heart as he began this section. I'm not lying, my conscience testifies. I'm telling the truth in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow, unceasing grief in my heart, willing to be accursed for the sake of my brethren, kinsmen according to the flesh, because of the privileges that are theirs and through the Jews we have our Bibles, we have our Savior, we have our Christian faith. My heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. He testifies they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. May we know more of Paul's burden and heart. And in understanding your past, present, future plan for Israel, may we understand our Bibles better. May we know the comforts that are ours in this church age in Christ, that we can count on you because you will not break your promises to anyone, including the Jews. And you are faithful, and you are merciful, and you are shocking, and you are surprising in your sovereign grace. And you are free in your mercy, and we are humbled by that. And may it drive us, as Paul concludes this section, to say, Behold our God, in our Savior's great name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to look this morning at two truths about Israel's future. If we're going to be humbled of our Gentile pride, if we are going to magnify God's mercy and be fueled for an evangelism of of, of the Jews in particular and have the attitude that Gentile Christians ought to have, and I think we are mostly Gentiles. Is there anyone here that is of Jewish descent? So we are 100% Gentile Christians and perhaps visitors, and some of you may not yet know Christ here today. If we are going to humble our pride and magnify God's mercy, we need these true truths about Israel's future. First, the promise of Israel's future salvation, and then the premise, supporting such a glorious hope. The promise of Israel's future salvation, verse 25 through 26a, and then verse 26b through verse 32, the premise supporting such a glorious 
hope. In other words, we need to be humbled at what God promises, point one, and then second point, at why God promises it. Let's look first of all at the promise of Israel's future, salvation, being humbled at what God has promised for the Jews. Look at verse 25 as Paul begins there in our text. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Brothers and sisters, please understand this Ignorance about Israel is a real risk. It's not just some hypothetical scenario or some seminary academic ivory tower obscure debate. It's a very real danger for the church in every age. My co-leader and our fellow seminary faculty member and sister church, David DeBrain, over at New Covenant Baptist, He recommended to me a good book a few years ago that I read entitled Israel Matters, Why Christians Must Think Differently About the People and the Land. It's written by Gerald McDermott, an Anglican theologian, formerly a covenantalist who believed the church was the new Israel. Until McDermott, McDermott examined scripture more closely on this subject. And these are the opening lines of his excellent book. He says, quote, most Christians for most of Christian history, have been wrong about Israel. Can I repeat that? Most Christians, for most of Christian history, have been wrong about Israel. And I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. No wonder Paul says this. The majority Christian view has been, and they are good and godly names, and Puritans and others, and Reformers, I quote them every Sunday, we don't, we don't say they're going to hell. We say they're wrong on this matter. That the church has superseded or replaced Israel. Specifically, speaking of Romans 11, this uh, Anglican scholar, McDermott, writes, if Paul thought that Christ expanded Israel to include Jews and Gentiles without distinction any longer, why does Paul distinguish between the wild branches, Gentiles, and the natural root, Israel? There's no other way to explain it if there isn't still a future for them. In fact, it's what makes Paul's words here all the more remarkable. He says, right, in verse 13, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. He's passionate about Gentile salvation, about the full inclusion into the body of Christ of every tribe and every tongue, full equality before Calvary's cross at the foot of Golgotha. Galatians chapter three, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. However, despite all these deep new covenant convictions, still Paul sees a necessary distinction between the natural olive tree and the wild branches grafted in. By the way, I think we still more than ever must emphatically say that is also true with men and women. (laughs) Equal yet different and distinct and you don't get to self-identify or transition in or out of that. And yet all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, look again at the text. Paul says, I don't want you, brethren, to be uh, uh, uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Who in Proverbs is wise in his own eyes? (laughs) What makes the book of Judges so dark and gloomy? It says, for everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Instead of like the fool, instead of like the wise who fear the Lord, humble themselves before his word. Paul's addressing you here. It's plural in verse 25. All of you, Roman Christians in a a largely Gentile church. What a huge difference this makes in the way we read the Old Testament, church family. Two-thirds of your Bible, which we should be feasting on daily and often. But sadly, most Christians, I'm afraid, read the Old Testament with the typical anti-Jewish Gentile arrogance and a kind of, if you know church history, a kind of Augustinian bias, I'm afraid, and an ignorance. 
And so every time you read Israel in the Old Testament, you just do a little uh, uh, find and replace, you know, in Microsoft Word function, you know, control, alt, delete, or, or find, replace. And you, every time you see Israel, you just insert me, <laughs> you know, us, the church, right? But basically, it's, it's me. Let's, let's admit it. That is a cut and paste anti-Semitic hermeneutic, however sincere. And it's exactly what Paul's warning about throughout this whole chapter of Romans 11. Ah, but you say, Tim, come on, come on. Why then are there so many Old Testament Israelite labels and Jewish terms transferred to the church in the New Testament? I'm glad that you asked. For example, 1 Peter chapter 2. Offspring of Abraham, Romans chapter uh, 4, a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, right? We are the true circumcision, Philippians 3, on and on it goes. Answer, Romans 11. We've been grafted in. Welcome to the family. Amen to all of those promises. But please hear me, sharing does not equal replacing. Participating in Jewish privileges does not equal canceling God's original promise to the Jews. Joining and being included in these covenant privileges does not mean breaking an original covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, Jesus says, as we'll see later in Matthew 21, uh, in our Sunday morning studies in Matthew, in this church age, the blessings of God's kingdom have been temporarily taken from the Jews and given to the church. But never is the church called the new Israel. Never are God's ethnic, national, territorial promises to Israel set aside in the New Testament. On the contrary, I believe they are repeatedly affirmed. Whether you go to Acts chapter 1, or Luke 1 and 2, or Matthew 19, or Acts chapter 3, or especially and explicitly Romans chapter 11. Keep reading there in verse 25. Paul says, brethren, I don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Uh, When he's talking about this mystery, please understand, beloved, this isn't some secret cult, some Gnostic club, some esoteric enigma or puzzling sort of brain teaser. It's a common and a rich New Testament word, musterion. It means an open secret. It means a revealed truth, something previously hidden and now disclosed and made clear and plain in Christ in this church age, in these last days. I don't want you to be ignorant about this mystery or or have Gentile arrogance about it. And now he spells it out, that a partial hardening, keep reading, verse 25, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Three aspects here I want to quickly show you under this first point, the promise of Israel's salvation, this mystery of Israel's future restoration. He spells it out and outlines it in three aspects. And it's right back to this whole pendulum story of God's surprising mercy. Notice, the present hardening of the Jews, the present ingathering of Gentiles, and the future salvation of Israel. Watch as it unfolds. Verse 25c, you could say, the first of these three aspects is the present hardening of the Jews. They have been moved off stage, you could say. They have been taken out of the spotlight. I don't know how else to interpret that. Look at the text for yourself. A partial hardening. They're spiritually calloused. They're dull and unresponsive. They're stiff-necked and hard-hearted. They're, they're in a rebellious condition of defiance against God. You find these Hebrew roots people that are like all about going back to Judaism. You want to talk about modern Judaism? It's frankly a satanic religion. About following the Talmud. David DeBrain and others have been telling me about rabbis today who will say to you, oh, the Tanakh, the Old Testament? Yeah, I heard about that from like my grandma. They are so steeped in satanic, blind brainwash from the Talmud and the Mishnah and every latest rabbi who sticks his picture up on a a sign towards Jerusalem. If you think all your Hebrew flags and all your Jewish dances make your church more Christian, you are wrong. That is not what we're saying. They are hardened. They reject the gospel. They hate Christ. 
They refuse to be saved. They deny they even need to be saved. Paul says that earlier in the, in the chapter, verses 7 through 10 of, this, of Romans 11 especially. But the question is, who's to blame? Chapter 10 shows that man is fully to blame. They refuse to believe. But chapter 9 shows that God is fully sovereign. And it all according to his elective decreed will. And we say, how long? How long, O Lord? And so Paul shows, secondly, the second uh, of these three aspects here. From the present hardening of the Jews, we turn to the present ingathering of the Gentiles. He moves them, the Jews, off stage so he can bring the Gentiles on stage. Keep reading. Verse 25 says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's you and me. Praise God. The full number of elect non-Jews brought into the kingdom. Right now, Jesus building his church, the gospel going forth, his spiritual kingdom advancing to the ends of the earth, the southern tip of Africa, the island of Madagascar, the townships of Soweto where we're busy doing church planting and uh, partnering with brothers, faithful brothers there, and Davyton where we uh, took up our, our Easter offering and the Tsongas that we hear about often from the Schley lines and the Myers and God's exact number of Gentiles that he is predestined will be brought to faith through the gospel. Every new convert, every baptism, every new church member. Because this is the point we are at in God's diary. It's the fullness of the Gentiles. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then, only then, the end will come. Until then. It's harvest time, bringing in the sheaves. What a joy. That's Romans 11 in a nutshell. Israel's rejection is neither total or final. It is only partial and it is temporary. And then the third aspect here, the heart of this whole passage, a spectacular hope, is after present hardening of the Jews, followed by present ingathering of the Gentiles, the third aspect is a future salvation of Israel. Look at verse 26. And so, all Israel will be saved. Once the very last Gentile fish is caught in God's gospel net, I don't think that last male or female, boy or girl, man or woman, will probably know it at the time, but it would be pretty cool one day to be a... Uh, eavesdrop in heaven and to see them find out are you serious like me like, I was the last Gentile to get saved to finally trigger the gathering in of the Jews in the tribulation period and how the rest of scripture spells that out like I got to be the, the, the last Gentile wow partial hardening fullness of the Gentiles, and so we need to look at some of these interpretive issues quickly here. This is the manner in which Israel will be saved. It's, it's the sequence Paul has been outlining, the pendulum the uh, picture and the olive tree picture. This is a summary. We're back to God's glorious, surprising mercy from Jews to Gentiles back to the Jews. And thus, you could say, and so, don't miss this key lesson, beloved, a crucial takeaway for all of us. God will make sure his saving grace always surprises its recipients. Are you with me? God has organized all of history to make sure nobody thinks they have a corner on his grace. As we're about to see, verses 30 to the end of the chapter. When the Jews thought they had a corner on his salvation, God sends Peter and Paul to the Gentiles. He starts with Cornelius. We were just there a few days ago. Joppa and, 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 and Caesarea. And then when the Gentile church starts thinking they have a corner on salvation, God will again save the Jews so that no one takes any credit for salvation. You cannot manipulate his grace no matter how hard you try. God will make sure he gets all the glory for his surprising grace and his free and sovereign mercy. And so all Israel, okay, what's going on here? It has to be, I believe, the nation of Israel as a whole ethnically, corporately, nationally in the last day. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, this is what we're praying for. I know many of our dear 
brothers in other theological camps will say, no, the church is now the, the new Israel. And this must refer to only uh, some of the elect remnant. But it violates the whole pattern of the chapter. It's a contrast to what is now a tiny little remnant of a few Israeli loses who actually got stuck in a rainstorm in the Drakensberg in South Africa. I hope he'll share his testimony tonight. And saw Christians who loved Zion and cared about Israel. And he got saved. But for every one Israeli lose, I'm telling you, friends, name another Jew you know who's a Christian and who is not fed up with your faith and will basically flip the finger at you when you preach them the gospel. Can we be frank? They're a tiny remnant of Jews who are coming to Christ. Paul is saying in contrast to that, all Israel, it has to be something more than just the, the current evangelism of the church. It's a national, it's a corporate restoration of the nation. And notice then Paul says they will be saved. Some sort of future event following the harvest of the Gentiles. And Paul doesn't say when that will be. That's why we do theology. That's why we fit the rest of the Bible together and we take a whole canon of scripture approach to this, especially the book of Revelation, which is given for the purpose of knowing how the future will unfold. Jeremiah chapter 30 says it would be a time of Jacob's trouble, a time of terrible suffering in Israel. And Revelation chapter six and following spells that out. Seals followed by trumpets, followed seven seals, followed by seven trumpets, followed by seven bowls of judgment. An awful, horrific final holocaust over a seven year period. Many Jews through that turning to Christ. 144,000 from the 12 tribes now bearing gospel witness. An incredible evangelistic force, Revelation 7. Revelation 11, two miraculous witnesses with uh, awesome wonder-working powers. Revelation 10, an angel in the mid-heavens preaching the gospel, the ultimate pulpit. At history's darkest hour, as Antichrist terrorizes the earth, as Israel faces horrific judgments from God, at last Jews will repent and turn to Christ. God fulfilling his ancient promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob in the most literal, most visible, most tangible and climactic way. All Israel will be saved. And it should not surprise us if we know his word, if we've read our Old Testaments, not to mention these New Testament passages of, that we're looking at. God said, Ezekiel 36, I will take you, the Jews, from the nations, gather you from all the lands. 1948, 1967, could it be, should it be, might it be? How could you not be thinking that this is in some way prophetic or pre-prophetic? We live in those times. Those soldiers in 1967 prayed at that wall for the first time in 2,000 years. You wonder why they wept. But they don't know Christ. God says, I will bring you into your own land. I will cleanse you. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Put my spirit in you. Cause you to obey me. Ezekiel 36. Jeremiah 31. Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Put my law within them. Forgive their sin and so forth. Jeremiah 32 goes on to say, Behold, I will gather Israel out of all the lands where I've driven them. In my anger, I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. That sure isn't happening yet. You get off the plane, what's the first thing you notice in Israel? Machine guns everywhere. Held by the right people, and so everyone else feels safe. In South Africa, they're held by all the wrong people, so we're terrified. But that's another subject. <laughs> I will gather Israel out of all the lands where I've driven them in my anger. I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and all my soul. Look again at verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. The core of this mystery, verse 25. What's most new and unknown and unrevealed before? It's not that Israel would be hardened. The Old Testament said so. It's not that Jews or Gentiles would be saved. The Old Testament said so. No, the, the, the mystery now revealed is the sequence in which it would happen. The order, the timing, the chronology of it all. Who would have ever guessed that there would be this church age 
This novel idea, it would seem, that God would set aside the majority of Jews, his ethnic people, while pagan, unclean, filthy, goyim, Gentiles would stream in, enjoy all the blessings of salvation, and only when that stream was exhausted would Israel as a whole experience these blessings. Who would have thunk it? Don't be uninformed of this mystery. Are we not humbled as Gentile Christians? We wake up every day and say, Lord, I can serve you. I can trust you because you're faithful. You never break your promise. You keep your word to me as individually chosen by you, to us as your church, and to the Jews one day. I'm not some VIP in your program. Your plan for Israel is not done. Church history is amazing already. <laughs> My salvation is amazing, but you're not done amazing us. Watch this space. <laughs> Stay tuned for coming attractions. The best is yet to come. All Israel will be saved. He's not done showing off, stunning the universe with his glory and how he saves all his people, both his church and his ethnic chosen nation, Israel, that they may know that I am the Lord. That great recurring phrase dozens of times in Ezekiel. Forgotten, no, that cannot be. The oath of him that cannot lie is on thy city and thy land, an oath to all eternity. Forgotten, no, that cannot be. The grace of ages deep and broad is grace without decay, the grace of, O Israel, of the Lord thy God. Forgotten, no, that cannot be. Sun, moon, and stars may cease to shine, but thou shalt be remembered still, for thou art his and he is thine. Borrowing straight from the language of Jeremiah's prophecies. Well, more briefly, our second point, we've seen the promise of Israel's salvation. Look now briefly at the premise that supports such a glorious hope, the premise. Another thing that ought to humble us. We saw what God promises and now we see why he promises to save Israel here. This also has three subpoints. I'll give them to you quickly. The premise, or is really the premise is, behind this promise of Israel's salvation, verse 26b to the end of verse 32. There's three premises. Because it's biblical, it's irrevocable, and it's merciful. It's biblical, it's irrevocable, and it's merciful. We're gonna see the premises of God's covenant. It's biblical, God's nature, it's irrevocable, and God's grace, it's merciful. Horatius Bonar, 19th century Scottish pastor long before any American or dispensational debates. I don't think he was even a Baptist. Bonar says, I believe that God's purpose regarding our world can only be understood when we understand God's purpose for Israel. No wonder so many good men in the States right now are fighting over a, a Christian nationalism. They don't understand Israel. Until they get that, they won't get this debate about Christian nationalism and uh, American roots and important topics. Bonar says, I believe that all human calculations as to the earth's future, political, scientific, philosophical, religious, all these calculations will fail if it does not take into account Israel in the last day and God's great purpose. Bonar says, if God has set Israel as the great nation of the future, who are we to set aside God's arrangements? It's a very helpful booklet we're going to put in the newsletter this week. Horatius Bonar writes on the Jew. Here's the three reasons. First of all, the three premises. Israel's future salvation is biblical. Look at Paul. He quotes here now from his favorite Old Testament prophet, Isaiah chapter 59, the return of Christ. The Abrahamic and the new covenants fulfilled in the final cleansing of Israel and probably looking into the thousand year millennial reign of Christ as well. Paul doesn't tell us when Israel will be saved. Only, he also tells us something of how. It's through their sin being forgiven. It's through the gospel of grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, what the first eight chapters of Romans are all about, especially the first five chapters. What a hope, a hope for Jews, a hope for the world, a radical reversal of the current hardened state of Israel. Currently a godless, a worldly, a carnal people. I was so comforted as an American to hear once that a study has shown that there's only one nation more rude and impolite and with poor manners than Americans. <laughs> the Jews. <laughs> I wonder why. Two nations that have had so much light 
and spit in the face of the Almighty and hate the God who blessed them so. It's future, Israel, the premise is it's biblical. A second premise here, it's irrevocable. Keep reading, verse 28. From the standpoint of God's gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. Israel is an enemy of God, so Gentiles like you and me could be brought in and saved, but still she is loved by God because of his promises to the patriarchs. Not because Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob deserved it, but because God said it. I can't think of a better passage for Father's Day. <laughs> the promise to the fathers. Not individual election, but national election. Very sad. An esteemed, famous covenantal author of our day. I know and love some of his family members. O. Palmer Robertson. He says this must be, verse 28, they it must be elect Jews right now through the church, the remnant being reached. And you just said that there are enemies? How could you say that individual Jews being saved are our enemies or God's enemies if they're Christians? I, I, don't, I don't grasp that. That, that is a, a, a misunderstanding of this text. What's a Christian view of Jews today in a different way than lost Africans, lost Europeans, lost Australians, you cannot say that they are beloved enemies in the way the Jews are for the sake of the fathers. Tribes and tongues that across the planet are no more human. They're no more or less valuable in God's image. They're no more or less lost and needing Christ, but they are not elect as a nation Beloved because of a special promise to the fathers. J.C. Ryle, also not Baptist or American or dispensational. J.C. Ryle writes, I assert then that the Jews are at this moment a peculiar people, utterly separate from all other people on the face of the earth. How do we account for this extraordinary state of things? This was 150 years ago. Ryle continues, how shall we explain the unique, peculiar position which the Jewish people occupy in the world? Why, he says, Unlike Saxons and Danes and Normans and Flemings, this singular Jewish race still floats alone, separate and distinct and not destroyed. Says Ryle, it is my firm conviction that among the many difficulties of infidelity, the hardest questions for the unbeliever to answer, there's hardly anything more insurmountable than the ongoing continuance of the Jewish nation. He says it's a burdensome stone skeptics cannot remove no matter how hard they try. God has many witnesses to the truth of his word, but there is no witness, says J.C. Ryle, so unanswerable as the one who always keeps standing up and living and moving before the eyes of all mankind, the witness of the Jew. And yet we hardly ever hear this in Christian pulpits today. They are beloved enemies, like they were in Egypt, like they were wandering in the wilderness, like the whole book of Hosea illustrates with Gomer, like the whole story of Esther, right? God's beloved enemies. You have this Jewish girl with her uncle Mordecai deep in pagan Babylon in the capital of Susa and the original Hitler, Haman. It's, it's heartbreaking to go through Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as if there wasn't a Holocaust before and the Jewish people by their own resolve will never have another Holocaust. We require that you visit Yad Vashem on our trips but it is sad to see the blindness that until they repent and turn to Christ there's worse holocausts coming. Haman is about to wipe out the Jews. If only brave Queen Esther didn't stand in his way. Only the king had been able to sleep that night. Hadn't read of Mordecai's honors. And the Jewish nation is spared. I love the way Dr. Doug Bookman puts it. The parallel to the Jewish people during the last 2,000 years could hardly be more exact with the book of Esther. Whether by choice or by coercion, they've had to make their way in a hostile Gentile world, proving themselves remarkably adept, despised and hounded. Israel nonetheless has survived as a people. In the last 50 years, he says, it's been victorious in three remarkable wars, continues to survive as a nation, and skeptics and unbelievers attribute this to pluck and luck. But believers know better. There is a quiet, almighty hand of God 
who promised to preserve his people. Verse 29, because the gifts and calling of God, notice this is in relation to the national election of Israel. They are irrevocable, unbreakable, unalterable, irreversible, and immutable. Back to how Paul began in chapter nine. God, verse six, the word of God has not failed. As Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will pass away until all is fulfilled. Please hear me, beloved. God did not choose Israel for her goodness and he will not abandon her for her badness. And if he will, then he will also abandon you and me because we are no less arrogant and depraved. It was after the great evangelical revival of the 18th century through the mighty preaching of Wesley and Whitfield and others that the great missionary societies were born Church Missionary Society, London Missionary Society, South Africa owes the gospel, men like Moffat and Livingston to that movement. But that's not all that came out of that great revival. There was also, can someone get that back door there? Thanks. Our closing moments here. It was Lord Wilberforce, it was Lord Shaftesbury. It was the British people who dusted off their Bibles and started reading them. Government policy changed. Talk of the Jews coming back to their homeland, lobbying and eventually defeating the Turkish Ottoman Muslim Empire that had stood for some three, four hundred years. The famous Balfour Declaration, because Arthur Balfour read his Bible in 1917. All of this sparked less as a political movement and more as a spiritual revival. I got a book that I've begun, and they showed a presentation in Israel this week called Friends of Zion. You, look, you pick your name, Spafford, the hymn writer, Blackstone, Lloyd George, General Allenby, archaeologists, uh, numerous ones of them, dust started reading their Bible and discovered God's faithfulness and his unbroken covenant plan for the Jews. And they said, enough's enough. And they began to align themselves with God's purpose and to stand up against the unjust wickedness of the United Nations and the pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel agenda of the last 2,000 years. Jews started getting saved. Franz Dielich, Edersheim, Adolf Safer, David Barron, and others. Great biblical scholars the Lord raised up. We believe not only in the promise of Israel's salvation, but the premises. I told you it's biblical. I showed you it's irrevocable. And finally, it's merciful. Verses 30 to 32. It is merciful. And this is Paul reinforcing everything he said throughout this chapter. Look at verse 30. For just as you, you Gentiles, once were disobedient to God, but now you've been shown mercy because of their, the Jews' disobedience. Watch the pendulum swinging. So these also now have been disobedient, the Jews, that because of the mercy shown to you, Gentiles, they also may now, I think the idea here is <laughs> in these last days, <laughs> in the hope of Christ's coming, they also now would be, may be shown mercy. We're back full circle. Salvation is promised for all without distinction, but not all without exception. Don't misunderstand verse 32. God has shut up all in disobedience that he may show mercy to all. Two major groups here. All disobedient Gentiles, all unbelieving Israel, and the sin they've chosen for themselves. Behold the kindness, the severity of God. He judges, he hardens them in their unbelief. He pours out his mercy upon his elect Gentiles saving us now as he will one day upon his corporately elect Jewish nation. Let no one accuse God of playing favorites. Dare think that he shows partiality in salvation. I think John Piper sums it up well. God has employed 4,000 years of redemptive history to teach that he is free, not bound to save anyone because of his Jewishness or condemn anyone because of his non-Jewishness. Can God not at the end of the age, in the last days, having demonstrated his freedom beyond the shadow of a doubt, bring his free and sovereign election of the Jews to a climax by banishing ungodliness from Jacob and saving the whole nation? Whatever magnifies his mercy most. Rejecting the gospel in Israel is not the final word. It's a first step. <laughs> One of the most famous commentators in Romans, I'll close with this, was C.E.B. Cranfield. 
And Cranfield writes, I confess with shame myself. In print, I published more than on one occasion this language of the replacement of Israel by the church until I studied Romans 9, 10, and 11. Cranfield says, it's only where the church persists in refusing to learn this message, where we secretly, perhaps unconsciously, believe our own existence is based on human achievement, and we fail to understand God's mercy to us, only then are we unable to believe that he would have mercy for hardened Israel. And so we entertain this un- ugly and unbiblical notion that God is done with the Jews, that he's cast off Israel and has replaced her with the Christian church. Romans 9 through 11 emphatically forbids us to speak of the church once and for all, replacing the Jewish people. Let's pray. I love the way the hymn writer puts it. Lift up thine eyes, Jerusalem. Look round about and see how from afar thy children come and gather unto thee no more in childless widowhood, but mother of a multitude. From every land afar, thy sons and daughters come, the promised land, their heritage, Jerusalem, their home. No more an exiled, scattered race. Zion, at last, their dwelling place. O oh Lord, we confess, most of the time we sing, Behold Our God, a, a song directly taken from the final doxology of this chapter. And all we think about is ourselves. We sing it with such Gentile blindness. Forgive us. Help us also, as much as we celebrate our own salvation, to also, like Paul, to marvel even more, to be even more stunned with the God-centeredness of your grace and mercy by also realizing your unique ethnic and national covenantal promised purposes for the Jews so that we would extol your faithfulness and trust your promises and celebrate your free and sovereign grace and your magnificent mercy even more, both in your election of individuals and in your election of a nation. From you and through you and to you be all things. To you be the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.